It gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Ollie Duke Williams, who's a senior lecturer in the Department of Information Studies here at UCL. He's been here since 2011. Uh, came here before, uh, before that he was at the uh, University of Leeds in the Geography Department uh, and uh, he's most interested, as you'll be hearing later today, in uh, census data because he's uh, working with the ESRC funded UK data service, um, particularly with reference to census material. His research interests include access to demographic data, disclosure control issues, uh, especially those related to migration and commuting data, uh, and the past, present, and future of census taking and other demographic information capture in the UK. And I think he's going to talk about some of those things today, plus some secret extras, which are hinted at in the slide title there. Uh, the title is there. I will hand over to Ollie. He will talk for about half an hour, and then we will have hopefully 10 minutes worth of questions. So over to you, Ollie. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to you all and to anyone watching online. Uh, one of the first things I need to start with is an apology that I didn't use the proper intro slide uh, advertising this as part of uh, the UCL Lunch Hour Lectures series. So I've added it to my slide. The downside for me is it's, it's reduced my Twitter handle to the last three letters, but that's, that's my issue. As James said, I'm going to talk about uh, some census data. And in particular, one particular census data set that I work with on a project with colleagues at UCL. The data I'm talking about are the ONS Longitudinal Study. Uh, it's a specialized form of output from the census, and I'm going to explain exactly what it is and how we get it. But in order to use that, we have to acknowledge the creators of the data, ONS, and that we're using the data under various conditions. So, what can the census tell us about time travel in general? All of us are moving through time as we grow older. And the census in the UK takes a look at us every 10 years. Aggregate census data, which if you've used census data in any student projects at any time, are probably what you're familiar with, or if you've seen reports in the newspaper of how many people live in the country, that's what you're familiar with. They allow us to see a snapshot of the population of the country every 10 years. Longitudinal data, on the other hand, allow us to follow a group of people over time and to look at the changes for those individuals over time. As an example of this, I'm just gonna use one small example. Do people keep the same mode of transport for their journey to work? And this is the sort of question we can explore with longitudinal data. So I've chosen people who used a bicycle to travel to work in 2001, and then looked at how the same people traveled to work in 2011. Do they carry on using a bicycle? Do they use something else? What do people think? Hands up for bicycle. Okay, quite a few of you. Hands up for something else. Okay. What happens is this. On the left is all the people who cycled to work in 2001, and on the right are their outcomes in 2011, what mode they used in 2011. So 30% of people who cycled to work in 2001 also cycled to work in 2011. The largest fraction are car drivers. They cycled to work in 2001. By 2011, they were driving to work. This is looking at people who were employed at both points, so we don't miss anyone out. But it doesn't take into account any of the obvious things you might bring up of whether they've changed jobs, whether they've moved house, that sort of thing. But we can look at that in combination with the way variables change over time. If you're interested in active transport, and promoting cycling and uh, walking to work, this perhaps isn't terribly inspiring that most people end up driving uh, to work. And the bicycle isn't different to other categories in that respect. The tube and the train, people carry on using them. Every other mode, people end up driving to work, or the large, largest fraction of them. 
So that's one way we can look forwards in time. From one point in time, what are people doing 10 years, like, 10 years later? And we can apply those transitions to other questions we look at. So if we look at some data in the past, someone who is your age now, what are they doing now? What were they doing 10 years ago? What were they doing 10 years into their future? If we shift the time down a bit, does that tell the same story that you'll experience? We can also use the census, the longitudinal study, to look back in time. Different questions are introduced with each census. So we get new questions each time. If we're interested in religion, for example, that was first asked in England and Wales in 2001. If we're interested in religion at an earlier period, well, we can take those 200, 2001 responses and assume, and possibly it's a good assumption, possibly not, assume that they had a, the same religion in 1991 or 1981 and consider how that might have affected what they were doing or what they experienced. Where do these data come from? They come from the ONS Longitudinal Study. It's a 1.1% sample of people in England and Wales, plus other people who were living in the sample members' households. We've got data from 1971 through to 2011, or as many of those census years as the person was alive and in the country and captured in the census. When we talk about longitudinal study, uh, many people are familiar with uh, cohort studies such as, such as the Millennium Study or the 7UP series of programs on television, and those follow a single cohort of people through time. The longitudinal study samples people of all ages. The way it does that is to pick four sample birth dates. That gives us a sample of four over 365 and a quarter, which gives us the 1.1% sample. People don't know whether or not they're in the longitudinal study. So by probability, I'm not sure how many people there are here, maybe one of you is in it, maybe not, we don't know. As I said, the this, this study also captures other people living in the same household, um, and they're not linked over time. So how can we use this? Well, using regular census data, we can compare groups of people. So people who were adults in the 1980s, we can get some sort of picture of what they were like in the 1950s. Not because our data go back that far, but because we know something about their history. Contrast people who were teenagers in the 80s, we can see them now as adults. I've used these dates not because they're census dates, uh, but because they relate to the example I'm using of Back to the Future. So the film Back to the Future, how many people have seen the film? Okay, most of you, I've, I've tried to avoid plot spoilers, but um, I'll run with it. So it opens in 1985 uh, with the character Marty McFly. He's aged 17 and he lives with his parents, and his parents are 30 years older than him. In the course of the film, he travels back in time to 1955, where he meets his future parents, the teenagers who will become his parents. In 1985, they're the same age, 17, as he is in 1985. And at the end of the film, uh, he travels forward in time, again another 30 years to 2015. Whilst in 1955, he breaks the golden rule of all time travel stories. Don't interfere in your own future. We know that bad things happen when you do this. As a result, we see in the narrative of the film that Marty's future has changed. In the original timeline, his father is a bullied, low-grade employee, and the children have menial jobs. In the altered timeline that we see later on, uh, George, Marty's father, is a successful author, and his siblings are professionally employed, um, and the family seems to be successful. In 2015, we're told that Marty's turned out fine, but there are problems with his son. So what's changed? What's happened with, Mar with George, Marty's father? What seems to have been related to his success is his level of education. We also see differing romantic success. 
The children's outcomes, Marty and his siblings, seem to be strongly dependent on their parents' outcomes. When George is a low-grade employee, the children don't do well. When George is a professional or, or high-status employee, his children do much better. So the film has a sort of limited picture of social mobility. And it's just that the children's outcomes are very similar to their parents. And we can use the longitudinal study to explore those ideas of social mobility. And this is one of the major uses of the longitudinal study. So how did we do that? Well, we picked two groups of, um, a number of groups of people. Um, people who were living with their parents in 1981 and choosing that as the nearest date the nearest census date to 1985. And we followed them forward and saw them living with their own children some 30 years later. So how did we exactly get the sample? In 1985, Marty is aged 17 in the film. We can pick 17-year-olds. We've got individual years of age. But to get a slightly larger sample, to have more people, we used three years, 15 to 17. We can see them in the 1981 census, and at the time they were aged 11 to 13. We can also see, as other people in the household, those children's parents. And some of those parents, to fit the narrative of the film, will have had their education in the 1950s. We don't have data about the 1950s, but we do have information about their parents' highest educational qualifications. So we get a picture of what they were doing in the 1950s and 1960s. We can move those sample members forward to the 2011 census and see them when they're adults. To put it another way, we can illustrate it like this. In the middle, in 1985, we've got Marty and his father. We can see his father 30 years before in 1985. We can see Marty 30 years later in 2015. So that's going two ways. It's like having two uh, time machines at the same time. So if we consider the issue of education, we can look at Marty's parents' education. So the columns here, labelled George and Lorraine, these are the highest qualifications of people, parents who were living with their children in 1981. And the rows of this are looking at what happened to the child afterwards, by the time they're grown up. And what we see is, is our would-be Marty, using UK data rather than US data, is strongly related to his parents' qualifications. If Marty's parents have a degree or a higher degree, then the, the chance of Marty himself having a degree or higher degree is 72%. In contrast, if his parents are unqualified, the right-hand column, then Marty isn't likely to have a degree. He's far more likely to have a, a below degree level of education. So this, again, continues the, the suggestion of the film of limited social mobility, unfortunately. There's slightly better news uh, with Marty's romantic outcomes. It isn't related to his parents' level of qualification. Uh, regardless of his parents' highest level of qualification, uh, Marty, or would-be Marty, is most likely to be married or in a civil partnership. And there's some variation with education of his parents, but much less so than the previous slide we saw, which was about Marty's level of education. So that's one example of how we can move forwards and backwards in time using the longitudinal study to compare a long time period from the 1950s to the 2010s. As I've said before, not all questions are asked in each census. So for example, if we wanted to know about religion in 1981, the aggregate census data, the ones people are most familiar with using, they're no good to us because religion wasn't asked in 1981. Using, LA, using the LS, 
We can observe an individual's religion in 2001 or 2011, and then look back to 1981 and look at characteristics of the individual then. But we have a question, does religion remain constant? Are you the same religion as an adult that you were as a child? And one way of exploring that is the Jedi phenomenon in the census. In the 2001 series of censuses, there were campaigns in a number of countries, primarily New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the UK, for people to complete their census form and write Jedi or Jedi Knight in as their religion. And we saw Jedi populations in each of those countries. When we look in later years, in later censuses, the Jedi population appears to have fallen. Now I've picked some examples there. Not all censuses ask questions about religion. So these ones do. 2001 was the first time the UK had asked a question about religion. Oh, England and Wales, I should say, I'm sorry. There have been questions for a long time in Northern Ireland about religion. The American census, for example, doesn't ask questions about religion. So what should we make of Jedi responses in censuses? We can start with just thinking about the terminology. So Jedi has been referred to as a fiction-based religion, an invented religion, a hyper-real religion. And I've used the, the term in these slides, a non-traditional religion. But we can start to think about whether this is a hoax, whether it's a bit of fun, or whether it's a genuine level of belief. So um, Possum I, uh, who, who's written about this, uh, quoting an Australian source with the Australian experience of this, um, said that of 70,000 Jedi in the 2001 census in Australia, uh, there was a suggestion that maybe 5,000 of them had some genuine sort of spiritual belief. But that source was a, a self-identified Jedi master. Now, perhaps, he, perhaps he's right. Perhaps he has some genuine belief. Or she. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know whether it's a, a man or a woman. Um, but we can't tell. It's interesting, though, I think, in how we think about this, because it relates to other issues of national identity. And we might think, or self-identity, we might think about the Jedi experience as sort of a bit of fun, and for many people it is. But we think about how to represent identity in the census, and we can contrast it with uh, national identity. So in uh, the UK in 2001, there was a question on the census form about national identity, and you could identify yourself as being Scottish. You could identify yourself as being Irish, but you couldn't identify yourself as being Welsh. And this led to campaigns in Wales for people to either boycott the census or to tick other and write Welsh in. And what we saw is that, on the whole, people didn't boycott the census. They, they wrote in Welsh as their identity, or some people. Um, by 2011, there was a distinct Welsh tick box on the census. And now we're currently seeing campaigns for Cornish to be included as an identity in the census in 2021. And this is something to us about census design and what the census is for. Previously, the census has been based on a paper form, and we can easily make an appeal to practicality. We can't list every possible religion with a tick box. We can't list every possible national identity with a tick box because there isn't enough space on the form. But in 2021, our census will be online for most people. And that changes the game a bit. As well as tick boxes, or instead of tick boxes, we can have a pull-down menu. And that can be as long as you like. And we're used to long menus for items such as country of birth. So what religions should we include on a religion pull-down menu? So if we consider Jedi, in 2001 in England and Wales, with 390,000 Jedi, it was the largest non-traditional religion recorded in the census. 
by some considerable margin. The next, next highest religion that we might think of as non-traditional, uh, not necessarily invented or fictive, uh, was pagan. In 2011, there were fewer Jedi, 176, 177,000. But it remained the largest single category of these non-traditional religions. And what we can ask is whether these are the same group of people. Is one set of Jedi appearing in 2001, maybe as a protest, maybe as a bit of fun, and then disappearing again, and being replaced by a different but smaller set of people? Or are some people continuing to be Jedi? And we can use the LS to explore these ideas. And we can think more generally about religion and religious conversion, because this is essentially the story of Star Wars. In episodes one to three, and you'd be forgiven for ignoring them, uh, they're essentially about the conversion of Anakin Skywalker from a Jedi novice to Sith. In Star Wars, in the chronologically first film, or in terms of release first film, we meet Luke Skywalker, he is a new adherent of Jediism, and this film seems to say that anyone, a farm boy from nowhere, can become a Jedi. The Empire Strikes Back seems to tell us that it's about bloodline. And Jedi might be a religion, but those people who can use the Force have to have some sort of genetic predisposition or some other dis undisclosed way of using the Force. Return of the Jedi returns to the idea of conversion, and we see a rejection of Sith ideology by Darth Vader, and he returns to the Jedi. And what we find looking at the census is that religion isn't an immutable characteristic. It can change. And to look at that, we looked at people in 2001 and 2011. And this is a table of people uh, of major religions uh, who were present at both times in the census. And we can focus, using my handy pointer, at Jedi. This cell here, 347, this is up from a 1% sample of the population. It's not the whole. 347 people out of 2,600 were Jedi in 2001 and weren't Jedi. Sorry, sorry, were Jedi in 2001 and still Jedi in 2011. 741 people were Jedi in 2001 and had become Christian by 2011. But the largest group of people are these ones here, who were Jedi in 2001 and indicated that they had no religion in 2011. And we can visualize this with the Sankey diagram as well, so this is exactly the same data as the row that was highlighted on the previous page. Um, Jedi are a fairly small proportion in 2011 of those people who were Jedi in 2001. Most of the numbers in the previous uh, slide, some of the cells were masked out. That's because the numbers were small. The only religion, uh, apart from Christianity, that was, had a large enough uh, number to report were, were those converting from Jedi to Buddhist. But it's, it's a fairly small set of people. Is this just about age? We can look at the pro age profiles of people converting to or from Jedi. On the left-hand side, we've got people converting over the period 2001 to 2011 from Jedi to something else. It might be to, to, to Christian, it might be to no religion, it might be to something else. And we can see that as being very tightly focused in terms of its age. People who were aged uh, 30 to 39 in 2011. So they were 20 to 29 in 2001 when they said they were Jedi. They're the most strongly sort of focused group of people converting out of the religion. On the right hand side, we've got people converting to Jedi. So they were something else in 2001. By 2011, they reported their religion as Jedi. And that's got a rather flatter profile. 
you also notice that the scales are different, the Y scales are different on these two. But again, it's kind of dominated by, or the modal value is our, our younger people. How does that compare to everyone else? Are Jedi the same or different to everyone else? This is an age profile of all people in the LS changing religion uh, in the period 2001 to 2011. So they were present at both points, they indicated a religion at both points, um, and that point is worth stressing because the question is optional. And I've ignored people who didn't complete the question. This is recoded a bit. I've grouped some of the religions. In particular, there are a large number of dis different Christian denominations identified in the census, and I've grouped them into one Christian category. And we see this age profile as very similar to our previous slide of those converting uh, away from being Jedi. So this is truncated because of small numbers, at, uh, 60 to 64. Uh, this one, on the other hand, which is based on single years of age, uh, we've got enough people to, to continue up to age 90 plus. But it's these people in their young 20s, primarily, who are changing from one religion to another. And I think there are very interesting questions to be explored there about religion and about identity. Um, because those people who were in their 20s there who were indicating a change of religion, they were living, almost suddenly, they were living at home with their parents 10 years previously to this, in 2001. And it was, may well have been their parent who completed the census form and indicated a religion. And 10 years later, they may well have left home and have their own idea about what their religion is. So, returning to the idea of the force. So here we see Yoda. Um, this is a scene from The Empire Strikes Back, uh, where Yoda is saying to Luke Skywalker, uh, I'm old, I'm tired but you won't look as good as this when you're 900 years old. Does the force help us to maintain good health? Uh, this is a model using uh, just 2011 data when we're looking at the likelihood of people reporting their health as being good or very good. And our, our reference category here, our reference categories are no religion. So we're looking at differences between traditional religions, Jedi and other non-traditional with no religion uh, and with good health. So Jedi are more likely than people with no religion to indicate that they were, their, he their, their health wasn't good. For traditional religions, there's very little difference, and, and it's not significant, uh, anyway, uh, between them and people with no religion. So traditional religions and no religion, we don't see a difference in how they declare their, their health. What's interesting, perhaps, about this is that Jedi are very similar to our category other non-traditional religions. So these aren't the major religions, not uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, etc. Um, they're more similar to these other non-traditional religions. And returning to our idea of, of invented religions or fiction-based religions, some of these other non-traditional religions are, we assume, invented religions. Some are not. And that idea of invented religions is a bit difficult to, to specify, I think. Because critics of religion might say, well, all religions are invented. And it's hard to distinguish between different sorts of religions sometimes. So the religions we're looking at here, things like Jediism, can we distinguish them from parody religions? So examples such as uh, Discordianism, and Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Religions that were explicitly set up as parodic of religion. 
Those sorts of things might be included in other non-traditional religions, but we're also including things in those which clearly have a genuine belief structure. So on this basis, Jedi looks a bit like a non-traditional religion, and it doesn't look like no religion. Perhaps interesting, given the large shift of people from Jedi to, to no religion over time. How do census agencies deal with this? And I've put problem in brackets. Is it a problem? Um, so there were, there were campaigns in 2001. And different census agencies around the world seem to deal with this in a different way that I think is interesting to look at. ONS, the Office for National Statistics, seem to view it, uh, whether in hindsight or, or not, as a route to engagement. So they, they did a press release, uh, headlined 390,000 Jedi there are. So trying to engage with the idea, trying to make something positive out of this, this form of protest. Other census agencies did, didn't take that tactic. They tried to, uh, it seemed to me, tried to play it down, tried to pretend that this sort of thing wasn't happening. So ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, had a very dry press release prior to 2001 about this campaign, uh, stressing the importance of filling in the census and filling in the census properly and giving the right answers. But I wonder whether Jedi, the Jedi experience, shows that we can gain something from this. The census traditionally faces problems with capture for, of data from young adults, especially young men. Those recording their religion as Jedi tend to be young men. Does the Jedi phenomenon, therefore, encourage young men to complete their census when they might otherwise have not done so? And so I looked at the likelihood of completing the 2001 census, given that people had already completed their 2001 census, and compared by religion. And here we're looking at the likelihood of being present in the 2011 census. And what we find is that people who identified in 2001 as Jedi were less likely than our reference category of Christian to have completed their census form. And what we see is, of all of these religions, um, most of them are less likely than people in the Christian category to complete their religion. It's taking age into account. Um, it's also using gender in the model with female as a reference category. So men were less likely to complete their census form than women. One of the things we're currently looking at is uh, analysis of imputation. Do people give the same quality of response uh, in the rest of their census form uh, for different groups of people? And we're starting with a hypothesis. Jedi are no different to anyone else. There's a couple of alternate hypotheses. First, that the Jedi census phenomenon is a form of social protest. You complete your census form solely in order to, to write Jedi in, and the rest of the form you don't pay much attention to, and therefore your response might be poor. Alternatively, complete or do not complete. There is no half-hearted form filling. The Jedi fill in the rest of the form well, and we'll be able to see this looking at their imputation flags, whether they'd missed fields out, whether fields had to be edited. All of that's to come, though. So what I've given is two examples of uh, using the LS. One, using the context of back to the future, moving forward and backwards in time. And two, using the, the Jedi in a more detailed sense, um, looking at particular characteristics of people. And these are all, as I said, using the ONS longitudinal study we have sister studies in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And one of the things I'd like to do is to encourage people to do their own, possibly less flippant, uh, forms of analysis on this. The data are free to use. You need to be accredited, and you need to have your project approved. And in the same way that we've got people here 
um, people watching remotely. So you can use the LS in person in a safe setting or remotely by submitting code which will be run. And in either case, the outputs must be checked and you can only take outputs out if they satisfy disclosure checks. And there are some URLs at the bottom there. Um, if you're interested, and I've got leaflets as well, if people want to know more. And um, <coughs> with that, I can complete it and say, any questions? Uh, thank you, Ollie. Um, we would like questions, but just before anybody starts to ask the questions, we have helpers here with microphones because we would like everyone to hear your brilliant questions. So can I get any questions from members of the audience? And then when you've got your hand up, somebody will come and grab you with a microphone. One here. Thank you. Um, what evidence or lack of evidence would you have that... Um, Jedi believers are more or less self-selecting than other groups. Um, in tr do you mean in terms of choosing what their religion are? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we've got limited uh, fields that are disposable. So we've got the census data, but we haven't got anything about motivation to complete. But it's the, the analysis I mentioned right at the end about looking at the quality of people's census response that I think will be interesting. It, it doesn't tell you about why, why they've chosen to be a Jedi or not, and that's something you'd have to do via surveying rather than via census. But I think it'd be interesting to look at the people's quality of response and how seriously they appear to take the rest of the census. Thank you for that question. Do we have others here? Yes, one at the back. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about age-related changes. For example, yeah. in your bicycle example, uh, I was expecting bicyclists to carry on bicycling, but of course, when you think about it, people get older and they're less likely to cycle. Yeah. As they get older, they may have more wealth to be able to afford a car, and if they get a car, there's more cars on the road, which makes it more dangerous for bicyclists. Yes. Thank you. Yes, the... the Cycle example comes from a, a separate project that I've been working on, and I just chose one sort of very quick slide to illustrate the problem. As you say, the age makes a big difference. Um, but I have looked at uh, continuation of cycling by age. Um, and what we find is, at a cross-sectional level, uh, it's young people who are more likely to be cycling to work for all sorts of reasons that, that are reasonably straightforward. Um, the people who are more likely to carry on cycling, however, are the older groups. So we get a big drop-off in the younger people cycling. But those who are older who cycle are more likely to carry on. Um, but I think that's useful. That's interesting if we're looking at policies that might target uh, active transport, um, about who we need to try and encourage to carry on cycling, and, and who perhaps we need to sort of look at uh, infrastructural changes in terms of road layout and, and so on, about how we can encourage cycling and walking. Further questions? I have a quick one. Yeah. Um, given that the census, I imagine, is something which is quite internationally important, that censuses happen in lots yeah. of places, and given that Star Wars is one of those global franchises, why is it only in these places that Jedi have become active in getting themselves onto the census? Um, the quick answer is that it was um, a sort of English-speaking campaign, I think. Uh, or those are the countries that first started it up. And there was a sort of international uh, sort of feedback loop, if you like, of emails get, getting sent around the, the net saying, if you, if you fill in your census as Jedi, the, the, the government will have to recognize it. And it doesn't matter whether you, you were writing that about the Australian government or the UK government, the argument still works. Uh, it, it wasn't just those countries. Uh, Croatia has got a big Jedi population as well. 
Um, part of it is uh, censuses that ask about religion. Uh, obviously, religion is a sort of contentious area, or can be a contentious area. Uh, not all censuses ask questions about religion. Thank you. Time for one last question, perhaps. Yes, we have one here. There's a Sorry. microphone. I have a question for uh, way into the future, whether um, the films remain popular and therefore whether the Jediism remains popular. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're interesting. We're running from our data. Uh, the question was about length of interest in the Jedi franchise, the Star Wars franchise. We run from 1971 through to 2011. The Star Wars films start in 1977 and it's still going. So it's, it's a really long running franchise. And, and you can look at who's interested and whether it's you know the same people interested now who were interested in the 70s and 80s. Um, but there's you know whole populations of kids who are, are coming to, to be interested in Star Wars films without having you know, seen you know, Star Wars first, that sort of thing. Will they sort of fill in Jedi as their religion? Well, we'll see in 2021. Um, you know, in, in the narrative of the film, the, the last one was called The Last Jedi, you know, and, and suggested that the Jedi are dying out. Will, will we see that? We've got a decline from 390,000 to 176,000. Will, will we continue to see a sort of steady decline to Yes. We'll have to watch his space, I think. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, there is a question here. Yes, this will have to be the last one, I think. But thank you, sir. Hi. Um, just thinking about gender, I can't remember what filling in the last form, but I presume at some point it was a binary question. Uh, yeah. And I presume in 2021 it won't be. Does that raise some interesting research um, prospects for you in terms of the uh, looking backwards in time? And yeah, that's a um, good question. I, I was supposed to give the first person who asked a question uh, one of our Celsius water bottles, which I completely forgot to do. So I'll, I'll give it to the last question. Um, so uh, gender and the census. Um, yeah, historically it's been male and female. ONS have been looking at uh, how to ask a question about gender identity. There was a story in the newspaper a few months ago saying, I mean, I'm not going to ask gender at all. And that was a complete misunderstanding of one ONS report that said, we're not sure what the best question is. Um, I don't think a final decision's been made, but ONS definitely wants to include a question about gender identity. Um, will it make a, a lot of difference? I don't know. What, one of the things we don't know is the proportion of people who identify as uh, a non-binary or not male or not female, whatever. And we need a census to find out. Um, but it's probably a relatively small proportion of people. So compared to the rest of the population, um, it, it will make a small contribution to analysis because there's a relatively small set of people involved. It's really interesting to, to find out uh, sort of where people are uh, and the experiences that they've had because they've almost certainly experienced sort of discriminatory behavior for, for various reasons. Um, so I really do hope that a question about gender identity uh, is included in the 2021 census. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, just like to wrap things up because we do have to, to leave the room fairly soon by uh, thanking, first of all, the organisers, secondly, you, the audience, and you, the audience, uh, out there on the internet as well. But most of all, Dr Ollie Duke-Williams. Thank you. Thank you.